right. Hello, everyone. So uh, I have not begun grading the exams, but I will, I will begin grading this week. So I'll hopefully have those back to you sometime next week um, will be my target. Today, we're going to follow up on last time. We kind of just talked about basics of wastewater treatment, what it's all about, kind of big picture of the process. Today we'll be talking specifically about secondary treatment and wastewater microbiology. So as, I, as we discussed last time, the secondary treatment is really this biological growth and then taking whatever grew in the, uh, this tank, whatever bacteria we had growing, and then removing those uh, cells. So this process is giving us a couple of different things. Mostly it's uh, helping us transport or transform the junk in the wastewater out um, and extract it as something that we can landfill or maybe even apply as a fertilizer. So typically our secondary treatment process can be encapsulated like this where we have this uh, control volume here. This will become even more important when we talk about how the residence time of the solids themselves instead of just the water. Um, this uh, control volume is including the secondary clarifier. So we have this, what we call the primary effluent. We have, you know, the screen racks, all that. Yeah. Is the projector supposed to be showing? No, the projector is actually supposed to be showing what I'm looking at on my screen. Thank you. Sorry. <laughs> for those for those online, they were they were getting the view normally, except that they could probably see the the screen in the background. All right. There we go. Okay. So now that you actually have something to pay attention to. <laughs> okay. So what I was saying is, uh, we've got this. Uh, control volume, this dashed line here, all the way around this, uh, this section. What we're going to find is there's some interesting differences between how we manage the water, the liquid, versus the actual solids. So we're going to get into that in more detail later. Uh, today we're really going to focus in on what's happening in this aeration tank. But we're going to come back and revisit this um, diagram um, a little more extensively because there's some important things happening when we remove all these bacterial cells and we recycle some of them and we send the rest to the waste, we have kind of new flows exiting our system. We have this waste activated sludge, WAS line here. It really ends up uh, becoming something that really controls a lot of the process. So we're going to talk about that um, we can have an aeration tank outside of a system like this where we don't have a clarifier. So we could just have like a, a CSTR just sitting there. Um, and that's going to be an example of what we'll work through at the end of class today is an example where essentially we are considering a pond to be that, that type of case where it's just um, pretty well mixed, stuff's growing in it, a stream is flowing in and a stream is flowing out and then looking at what's happening in terms of biological growth inside that pond. Okay, in a treatment plant, we're gonna typically have primary treatment, which is the, you know, a screen bar rack, and then an initial clarifier. Then the effluent from that process, we would consider our primary effluent. That's gonna be the influent for our secondary process. So we could write that as influent here secondary influent. So just to hopefully avoid a little bit of confusion there, what, what it's talking about is um, effluent usually means the discharge, but that's the discharge from the previous treatment step. Okay, then we've got this uh, waste activated sludge line leaving, and then the secondary effluent also leaving. So the activated sludge, so the, the RAS line, 
sorry, the, uh, really this here is the influent. Sorry, let me um, remove this um, message. There's just some sort of spam on the, okay, I blocked it. I don't know if it, the message is still there. It's just some link. Okay, I'll fix that later. So anybody watching online, if that's bothering you or if you see it still, just let me know what's going on. Um, okay, so the what I mean by the influent we will add this recycle line to the influent, but we've got this, the influent really is this space right here that's um, uh, coming in to the system, right? Okay, so we'll talk more about that. Um, so secondary treatment, really what we're dealing with is the microbes. So this is kind of the first time where we're uh, dealing with bacteria in a, in a way where we're trying to grow them and we're interested in having more of them. So here, um, first of all, this waste activated sludge, uh, this is kind of our terminology for that mixture of bacteria and waste stuff that's um, in the tank, mixing around, um, doing, doing all that process. So we call it activated because we're activating it with oxygen, um, it's active, it's doing this ongoing um, biological process. The aeration here uh, is really causing it to be well mixed. So if we have a big tank of water and we've got bubbles flowing upwards. Then really we see that um, that's going to keep this whole system rather well mixed. And then, of course, we've got stuff coming in and stuff going out. So it's CSTR for that reason. OK, we've mentioned BOD before, um, but this wastewater strength is the, we kind of estimate that with this term BOD, biological oxygen demand. We're going to take a closer look at BOD um, after we do wastewater and what happens into a river, uh, kind of after we cover wastewater treatment. So we'll talk more about this later, but for now it's basically that amount of oxygen that the bacteria are going to demand based on the stuff that's in the water. So just keep that in mind. It's kind of a funny term. It's oxygen that will be demanded um, and it equates to the amount of food, bac bacterial food, in the water. And typical ranges for this, this parameter are anywhere like 60 milligrams to 500 milligrams of BOD per liter in wastewater system. So if you're down at 50 or 60, that would be considered a very weak or dilute uh, wastewater. Whereas if you're up at 500, that's uh, very high strength. You can imagine if you have a bunch of rainwater diluting your system, then uh, maybe you're, you'd expect to have pretty dilute stuff. Whereas uh, if you've you're really only discharging very dirty water, um, then you're, you're going to be, you know, your system might be handling higher, higher strength um, waste. It, this becomes important, as we'll see soon, because bacteria, the speed at which they, um, speed at which they grow and how, how much they multiply really does depend on how much food they have. And so there's several dynamics. If your wastewater treatment plant is routinely experiencing some strength, uh, some given strength, and then it uh, instantly changes due to some external factor, that could actually change the biology enough to have an impact on the, the wastewater treatment. Okay, so that's an estimation of the amount of junk that we're treating. Uh, we have another estimation, uh, the volatile suspended solids here for the amount of bacteria. So we, it's not easy to count and say, okay, we have exactly this number of bacteria. That's uh, difficult to do. You, you know, maybe could grow some of them on a, a Petri dish or look at them under the microscope, but that's very involved and you don't wanna have to do that every time. So uh, a simpler way is to get an estimate. And this estimate is taken by 
essentially the same technique we use for a total suspended solids. We filter the, filter the water and then we dry the filter. We weigh it before and after to see how many solids we've collected. But then we take that and then heat it to 500 degrees Celsius and basically burn all the volatile stuff. Um, so anything that can be burned, anything that can be volatilized uh, is burned off. And then we weigh it again. So all of our bacteria that are carbon-based and have all these organic molecules, anything that's not like a piece of sand, you know, a, a sand grain or something, anything that can will be burned off. So this is a not a precise method, but it's a useful method to uh, estimate the amount of bacteria. So this is basically getting all of the organics that are caught in the filter and giving us a, a mass measurement of that. So this is going to be our uh, term that we're going to use to estimate uh, the concentration of bacteria. And we're going to use X as the term for that. Okay, so now we have two terms, a, a term for, and we'll see this in a minute, um, a term for the amount of food that's there and a term for the amount of bacteria that are there to eat the food. <clears throat> so just a couple more uh, basics about our secondary treatment here. Typical treatment is gonna remove uh, something like 95 to 98% of BOD, uh, the secondary treatment. Go back. Yeah. Yeah, so basically I was just summarizing that the, uh, this process, the volatile suspended solids, it's a measurement of all the organics that are caught in a, in a filter when doing this process. I don't remember what uh, what link I have here, so oops. Let me um, let me pause this and see what link we've got. It's probably a uh, activated sludge treatment. Just want to take a look. So just as an example here, we've got this uh, short video of a wastewater treatment plant in operation. So this is probably the where the primary treatment is flowing in to the secondary treatment right here. This looks to me like, okay, so that, that one on the right might be a um, clarifier or perhaps um, an anoxic so they're not supplying oxygen to it um, holding basin and on the left you see all those bubbles that would be our waste activated sludge so this person just walking around to see where it's flowing we can see here on the right this um, it's coming off kind of a laminar flow across the top there so I, I think that is the primary sedimentation um, basin there. So a rectangular one <clears throat> taking water off the top and then that's flowing around and into these uh, activated sludge basins here. So you see it's a uh, very nice and uh, nasty looking. I don't remember if I've mentioned this to you guys, but you really don't want to fall in that, and not just for the obvious reasons. Uh, if you did fall in that, they have escape ladders uh, set intervals because you're not going to be able to swim or float. With all those bubbles, you're going to be much less buoyant than normal. So not only are you swimming in nasty 
uh, sewage, but you're also not able to to get back out without um, without a ladder. So, if you ever tour a wastewater treatment plant, don't don't go for a swim. <laughs> okay, so this is it's just uh, showing you know a few different steps along this process. You can see they, they do appear fairly well mixed, even though they're kind of these long channels. Um, there's a lot of mixing going on. And with that amount of volume, they can keep the, you know, they can have a reasonably long residence time in, the, in this process. And I think it goes on to show, um, moving on from there, these next steps may be a, another clarifier where they, you end up getting all the floating stuff at the top um, and then the rest of the water is kind of moving slowly through. You can't, can't see the motion because the sludge, the foam layer, the scum layer. Um, is there like a buffer foam layer at the end of the day? Um, I think they do probably have a way to uh, harvest it and get rid of it. Um, Sometimes you can actually operate sedimentation basins in reverse where you add some very fine bubbles and cause things to float. Um, not, not large enough to cause mixing, but uh, so you, you can actually operate it that way on purpose sometimes. But yeah, usually there's, it's common to have a sludge layer like that. So this would then be the secondary effluent here. Um, and depending on their treatment, I think this is actually even in a, a different country. So depending on their standards and things, they might might put in a disinfection there um, or just potentially discharge from there. Um, yeah, so there's a there's an interesting thing that can happen if you get the wrong type of bacteria growing. Maybe you end up uh, shocking it with a bit of, you know, big pH change, temperature change, uh, the food consistency, like what, what types of foods, molecules are available. Sometimes you'll get the growth growth of the wrong type of bacteria, and then a lot more of the sludge will float, and uh, that becomes a pretty big problem uh, in some cases. So actually managing the, the type of bacteria can be important so that you can be sure that you are um, controlling the system and able to have your, um, your clarifier working. Because if your clarifier stops working, we'll talk about this more later, but then you're not able to recycle the sludge like you're you normally used to, so that it it just becomes uh, a compounding issue. So is that water that was entering that what was coming out of the pipes that was already prior to that, like the filtration? Yeah. So the question, and I'm I'm sorry for everyone online. I haven't been re repeating the questions. The stuff that we saw coming into that um, into that system, yeah, that would be the discharge from. Uh, the primary treatment. So whatever, um, and I think we saw part of the primary treatment there. We we didn't see the the screens, grit chamber, any of that type of stuff. Whatever they had in place, uh, but presumably we went the the flow would have gone through some sort of a screening and a chamber like that, and then into that clarifier. Um, it looked to me like that was into a, the first clarifier. That would be the last step in the primary treatment, and then it was going. Um, pumped along into the uh, activated sludge basin, and that was your. Uh, the water's not very clean looking. No, it's not very clean looking, but uh, it's cleaner than it started. <laughs> and the uh, the important part there, so it, you you could see it was kind of stained brown looking. So it doesn't look great, um, but remember that you can drink tea that looks very brown, right? So the real important thing that happens there in terms of like kind of the most glaring uh, obvious detriment to the environment if you're just going to discharge waste is they've removed a lot of the BOD. Um, so a lot of that oxygen that it's like a, a potential energy in a way. It's like how much potential is there for um, bacteria in nature to deplete the oxygen given this stuff. So Allowing that to happen up front, and then you discharge it. Um, you know, hopefully they disinfect, uh, but at, at least it's not going to just do widespread fish kills because of oxygen depletion, right? Mm -hmm. So, would you consider that water at any point in that? 
Um, so, and, and uh, this is funny because somebody here says, yeah, but we like tea. <laughs> um, so is it drinkable at any point? Uh, with that treatment, I don't think so. Um, I have visited a treatment plant. Um, this one was in Georgia and the operators, you know, and, and everybody said like, this is like the Mercedes of wastewater treatment here because it's a, they had all the bells and whistles and everything. And the operator said that he would be willing to drink their final effluent um, because of the disinfection in place and all of, all of these things. So I would only say, I mean, you can get water to drinkable standards. Uh, it depends on how much effort you want to put into it. And to do so, usually you'll use either reverse osmosis to um, make sure you can eliminate heavy metals, uh, pharmaceutical compounds, things like that. Um, or you can use an advanced oxidation process and, and maybe in combination with um, some filtration. The advanced oxidation would uh, destroy pharmaceutical compounds. So we don't think about it often, but our wastewater, we can actually detect uh, opioids, drugs, you know, other different things in there. And we, there are some studies about, okay, how much how much of these uh, pharmaceuticals and drugs are going out into nature and are they impacting um, natural systems? Uh, so we wouldn't want to be drinking that, even if we could guarantee that, okay, we've disinfected it, it's clean in terms of pathogens, uh, that's not so hard to do, but at, you know, what else is there? Are we exposed to heavy metals? You know, uh, what kind of chemicals are there? So there's, you'd want to be able to uh, kind of confirm by your technology that you've eliminated that. Um, Singapore is a good example. They actually use a full recycle of their water uh, because they don't, you know, it's not very cheap to get water there. So they're kind of on the leading edge of that, um, that process. And there might be some stigma about it, but once you get past that, we, we have the technology if we're willing to pay for that. Now, you know, chances are it's cheaper to just get more more water from the ground here in Louisiana and then discharge somewhere, um, just the way of things. Uh, and it, we can do so while protecting the intended uses of the waters, all of that. So in most cases, it doesn't become uh, useful, but the space station, obviously, is a, a good uh, case example in Singapore. And I'm, I'm guessing it'll happen a little more often in uh, places that are very starved for water. I don't know of anywhere in the U.S. that we have complete recycle yet, but I maybe there's something uh, recent that I, I'm not aware of. Okay, um, so I uh, wanted to talk a little bit about this process in terms of what we're removing. Yeah, question. Um, we, just, we saw a video of the, uh, I can't remember, that was draining our filtration, correct? We went through the process of it. That, that water was a lot clearer Okay, so the question was about comparing this water to the granular filtration we saw some, some time back. Uh, that's a great question. Um, the deal is when we're, we were employing granular filtration for a drinking water treatment plant. Okay. Um, so that's, now we saw it was very dirty when we were backwashing, right? So there was a fair amount of dirt coming in, but once we're done with that, you know, once we've discarded all the, the junk, yeah, it does look pretty clean at, by the end of it. And, and hopefully so. Um, in this, in the uh, primary treatment here for, for a system, for a wastewater system, we're not doing granular filtration. I s probably said the word grain. Um, we do grit chambers and s bar racks and screens to catch, um, to catch grains rather than using the granular media. Now there, there are some cases where we'll use like a slow sand filter and let the biological activity happen on the sand itself or on the grains. And so it's, it can be used in wastewater, but generally we don't use granular filtration. So was, that was a difference in uh, process there. That was a good question. Did we have another question? Okay. Uh, good questions. Okay, so I wanted to talk a little bit about um, what exactly we're removing and how we can estimate kind of what, 
what type of nutrients are removed or might be even needed in terms of being limiting. And this gets in a little bit to do with tertiary treatment. So after we get rid of all the, the oxygen demanding stuff, which is generally, this is a pretty much equivalent to the amount of carbon content. content. Or it's at least uh, directly related. So once we get rid of most of the carbon by doing this uh, aeration, then the tertiary treatment can come in and we, we might then want to remove the nitrogen and the phosphorus. Um, so what we want to know is the typical carbon to nitrogen to phosphorus ratios that our organisms are composed of. You could look at this with uh, humans. If you were to take the elemental composition of humans, you'll find some ratio Part of us are, are carbon, part nitrogen, part phosphorus. You can do the same things um, with really any, uh, any organic matter and find some ratio. So what we consider then is microbes in the wastewater, they're going to use, use these resources, um, at least making new cells out of the resources, based on some ratio like that. And it turns out that if we were to take a look at the wastewater microbes, their typical composition is um, 100 carbons. So for every 100 carbon atoms, you've got somewhere between 5 and 20 nitrogen and one phosphorus. Uh, we also use this type of analysis when we're talking about oceanography and trying to understand what's happening with algae blooms and uh, productivity in natural systems. Uh, so you might you might have heard in that uh, in that field the red field ratio uh, for algae, and it it falls somewhere between here. I think it's uh, ten to six or seven to one, or excuse me, one hundred to to six or seven to one, somewhere around there. Um, actually, I don't really remember, but it is within that range, and it's a a pretty standard and well defined one for um, algae in in the oceans and can help us understand, okay, are we phosphorus limited? This also helps us understand, okay, what happens if we do discharge wastewater or we've got a lot of runoff from a farm and then suddenly our, our pond now has plenty of phosphorus. Um, if that was the limiting nutrient, maybe the algae and bacteria then go bonanza and um, just uh, multiply quite a bit and can cause um, eutrophication or the, the issue where you get the um, oxygen depletion. Okay, so it's important for us several reasons, and I'm just bringing it up here because if we can handle the carbon, then we might need to add, you know, if we've removed all that, but we still have nitrogen and phosphorus left over, maybe we have to add a little carbon in another step um, some sugar or ethanol, something like that, to allow them to grow. Uh, I toured a wastewater treatment, um, the wastewater facilities within a tissue recycling plant. Um, so they would take cardboard and other um, you know, raw tissue recycling materials, and then essentially they were sending it through several processes, uh, extracting the um, fibrous and tissue materials and recasting that into toilet paper um, and other paper products. So that was the whole facility's um, process and along the way they would have a waste stream that had lots of um, lots of contamination from the residual uh, paperous materials which is mostly carbon. So they had um, almost all carbon in their waste stream. And so literally in order to to remove it, because they had to treat their, their waste, so they had to add fertilizer, essentially, to allow bacteria uh, to grow and consume the carbon. So they're adding jugs um, every hour or day or something of what you would 
maybe use in a farm, adding the nitrogen and the phosphorus, they're adding this to their waste activated sludge system so that the bacteria could actually grow and remove the carbon. <clears throat> Most of the time, there's a, a decent ratio and we don't have to worry about that unless we need to uh, concern ourselves with that tertiary step of removing more nitrogen or more phosphorus, uh, which is a good thing to do. Uh, but typically, you know, our municipal treatment steps, we can do removal for, of the BOD without any, any added stuff. So that's kind of a, um, an industrial example there that um, we'll call it a caveat. Right, so some, some cases have kind of special conditions where we might have to, to add some. Okay, so with that, we have some terminology now to talk about the waste treatment. And really what we're uh, gearing towards is understanding what's happening on that biological level, of how quickly the bacteria are growing. So this brings us to what we call the Monod equation and Monod kinetics. So Again, more terminology here, and we're going to center our discussion around this mu. Um, so this is going to be a, essentially our growth rate constant. Um, so mu here, as we've defined it, is a specific growth rate coefficient, and this is in per time. So we see that's going to be a first order growth um, and that's going to be what's driving the growth component of our uh, bacteria. We're going to find that the speed at which they grow is inversely or is proportional to the uh, speed at which they're consuming stuff and so we we can then estimate how much stuff are we getting rid of based on how quickly they're growing. Okay so that's kind of the approach here is we're going to use the same tools we've been building, um, rates, ha rates occurring within reactors, and apply these to biological growth to understand how quickly, how effectively are we removing the waste stuff. So here we see this is going to be first order growth. We haven't done a lot of growth equations so far. Most of the time we're doing decay. So that will be a, a difference here. So that's our mu here. That's like, you know, if we had um, dn dt is equal to kn, that k is this mu, right? So that's, that's what we're talking about here. Um, that's what this will end up looking like when we put, you know, if we were to have only growth and we're tracking the growth over time for for n, that's where it's going, right? And we have this uh, positive, this growth rate equation. So to understand this uh, rate coefficient, we have this equation. And we're going to break this down and try to understand what each of these pieces are, make some sense of them, so that we can um, understand why this uh, makes some sort of sense. So we define this growth coefficient and this is specific it says specific because it's specific to how much food we've got um, and in the conditions Re really it's the how much food we have so this is going to be equal to the maximum specific growth rate so if you feed them as much food as they could possibly want this mu m is the maximum specific growth rate coefficient so what we'll find is if you give bacteria an infinite amount of food, they'll reach some plateau. They won't grow any faster. They're just growing as fast as they can on those resources. So we, we have that built in. That's pretty easy to find experimentally. You just feed them a bunch and see how fast they grow. Then we've got S. S is our substrate concentration. So this is the amount of BOD per liter in the water. Okay, so that's the maximum they can grow, uh, the maximum um, growth rate coefficient times the amount of food they have. And we're going to divide this by um, Ks plus 
S. So this is KS term plus the amount of food they have. The KS is a value, an, another food value. So we see up here, we've got this per time value and a milligrams per liter value. So those are looking at the units down here, we have food concentration plus this term and the units are going to have to be the same. So we know that this is also going to be a food concentration term of some sort. So the KS, what it means, we call it the half velocity constant. And this is the value of S when the bacteria are growing at half of their maximum speed. So I'll show you a graph in a moment. Um, essentially, it is a, a food value at some point, right? It's the amount of food that's allowing the bacteria to grow half as fast as they could. Okay, so imagine you're, you're sitting here in class and you're kind of hungry. And you're not one of those watching online, so you're not making yourself pizza right now which we all kind of want to be doing, right? Um, so imagine you're not doing that, but you are going to in a couple hours. So you're like, you're half as productive, you're half as, no. <laughs> um, but half as happy, right? So that, imagine the bacteria about half as happy as they could be. That's, that's the amount of food they're getting. All right, so what would that look like? Well, if we plot the specific growth rate coefficient, so the rate at which they're growing, or that, not the rate, but the uh, rate coefficient for their growth, and we take a look at how that changes with the amount of food that we give them, so that's our x-axis here, the s, then we can imagine if they have no food, they start basically at zero, not growing anything. Now, if you have a little bit of food, they'll start growing, and eventually we'll hit a plateau when we get get the max amount ever, um, we should find a mu max um, way out there with enough, enough um, food. Okay, so that's, that kind of makes sense. Now what would this look like in between? Well, it turns out this ends up looking something like this. And, you know, I don't, I'm not drawing anything uh, precise here, so that maybe, maybe it would look a little different if you actually had real values, but some that's the right shape. Now, if you take, if this is mu max, and you divide that in half, this value is going to be your one half of mu max. Take this out to here, and find at what point, at what point does that um, cross the, the food axis? then this value here is our KS. Okay, so you don't really need to do stuff with this, but I want, wanted to sh kind of show you the meaning in this equation. So this would be milligrams BOD per liter, of course. So overall, this specific growth rate coefficient is capturing this uh, per time so the per time from this guy, that's the maximum at which they grow, multiplied by milligrams BOD per liter, divided by this KS, which we see here, plus whatever we happen to have at the time. So maybe we have a very strong wastewater and we're, our actual S is over here, um, and so in that case, you know, this KS would be added to a bigger number, or maybe we have a very weak wastewater and our S is over here, you know, you can see that's going to change, um, that's going to be changing our specific growth rate, um, and it's just changing based on this, this equation here. So then down at the bottom here we have milligrams BOD per liter. Um, really in both terms. So looking at these terms all together, these are going to cancel and we're just left with per time, which is what we expect. Again, this is a 
first order growth uh, rate constant, essentially. Okay, so that's our Monod equation. You have this on your um, equation sheet. I do need to update that, but I will, I will do so soon. So you'll see your um, the last version of your equation sheet will have everything you've had so far, and then it'll have our equations for microbial growth, wastewater treatment, all that. Okay, so that kind of gives us some perspective on what's happening here and how the growth rate depends on the amount of food. So one thing you'll notice is this mu max, we don't really know much about it. So this is a parameter that's pretty much given, um, I guess we could have everything else and solve for it, but essentially you probably have heard E. coli can replicate every X minutes, like 90 minutes or something, um, and duplicate. So they're, that's their doubling time. Other organisms are slower, some may be faster. It, that's, that duplication rate is really kind of considering this mu max. And so, you know, different organisms, it's just going to be specific to different ones. And in the case where we're considering this uh, waste activated sludge that has all sorts of organisms, usually there's four or five, maybe up to 10 species that compromise like 99, 98% of all. Um, bacteria in the system, even though there's thousands, if not millions of species there, most of them are just not really um, multiplying and don't don't comprise the uh, the majority of them. So there's going to be several species that are really responsible for the majority of the mass of microbes. And we can get some estimation of for those, what's our specific um, maximum specific growth rate. Okay, so in terms of taking this into a laboratory and measuring some growth, seeing what happens, um, so this is just kind of if you take a jar, give, give it a bunch of food and some microbes, let the microbes grow, what happens? Um, so we're, we're going to look at is the log of viable cell concentration, so the log value of live cells, so the kind of a logarithm scale here, uh, versus time. At first, there's not a lot of growth. Um, early on, the bacteria are probably kind of in a stationary mode where they're, they don't have much food, so they're just sort of sitting there surviving, um, not doing much. Once they start sensing food, it takes uh, maybe an hour or two, and then, and so we have this little lag phase, and then they start growing. Um, once they, they have this food, they start multiplying, turn on all of their growth processes. So then we have this uh, growth phase, typically lasts you know, something like 12 hours. Um, if we're doing some sort of microbial experiment, we usually incubate overnight, and then we can see our results based on the bacterial growth. Um, so probably anywhere between eight and 18 hours, maybe longer for uh, slower growing organisms. And then at some point, there's, there's really, um, they've reached um, a maximum population limit. Even if they have plenty of food, they're overcrowding. So they can't really grow, um, they, they can't grow because there's just too many bacteria there, they're um, in each other's space. So they'll hit a stationary phase and then eventually they'll start dying off, um, especially once once the uh, food is gone, um, then we'll, we'll have this death phase. So that's kind of a typical look at what's happening. Now I have this picture of a jar here and what we can consider, you know, as we start thinking about relating these mi microbial growth kinetics to a wastewater system, well, let's use X as our bacterial concentration. So this would, we'd have some initial concentration. S is the amount of food, that milligrams per liter of BOD. And then we have some amount of oxygen we add to the system. Now, later we'll get into tracking the oxygen and measuring the BOD based on what happens with the oxygen. Um, but for now, we just know that's, that's gonna be an important component. And if we mix this here, this would be a batch reactor because we just have 
you know, nothing coming in or going out. It's just mixing and we have the reaction that is a growth of bacteria. So my point here is we can sit here and watch if we have a way to measure S, which we do. We can sit here and track DSDT. So how is the food changing over time? And we can track DXDT. We have a way to count the bacteria, which we do. Um, and what we would be watching is the decay of S. So we're reducing S over time, the amount of food, and we're increasing the bacteria. So just a summation of everything we've said so far, if we put it in this bottle and we're to watch it. Okay. All right. So let's talk about the growth rate then. Um, now, we're going to take a look at growth rates, death rates, and the third rate we're going to look at is substrate utilization. And these will all be kind of interconnected. Um, so let's tackle the growth rate first. So we have this uh, monod kinetics, and if we write this as dx dt, so we're, again, we're using x as the microbe concentration. We've used n in the past. We're using x. I think it's helpful to differentiate because usually n has been a number concentration. And this is actually going to be that mass estimation. So this is going to be milligrams VSS per liter. Okay, so we're using that volatile suspended solids method to m estimate the uh, amount of mass of microbes. Okay, so I mentioned earlier, we could write this out if we did dx dt equals mu x. Um, I wrote it differently, I, I used the n, uh, but we're gonna use x here. So that's our, that's our growth equation. Um, so we can write our rate of growth, rg is mu x, and we can rewrite that as x times this Monod equation. So we have x times the mu max times s divided by ks plus s. All right, so that's our growth. Simple enough once we understand what's going into that equation. Um, nothing particularly tricky, just several parameters that we need to know um, in order to work with them. Then we've got a substrate utilization rate. So that's the next rate that we're going to work on. So we're going to basically estimate this using something called the yield coefficient. How much bacteria are we yielding given the amount of substrate we consume? So, you know, if we if we think about maybe you're growing rabbits and you want to know how many rabbits you can get per you know, sack of feed that you feed them. Um, you know, then you would estimate their, how quickly they multiply and how much food do they require during that time and you get some yield coefficient, how many rabbits per, uh, per bag of feed. It's the same thing here. We're saying, okay, how much mass of microbes do we get when we're you know, per mass of this oxygen demanding substance that we're consuming? So y is our parameter for that, our yield coefficient, capital Y. And we're going to say that our substrate utilization rate are, actually we're, we're going to say is our maximum, k, k will be our maximum substrate utilization rate, is going to be equal to the maximum growth rate divided by this yield coefficient. So just keep in mind there's a couple different k's here. This is a lowercase k. This is not the same as the k we've dealt with up here. Um, so that's, that's the only point of this here is just to show you that um, this is a new k. Different scenario here. This k is going to be um, helping us understand that substrate utilization rate. Okay, so k is that maximum specific substrate utilization rate coefficient. That's going to be milligrams VSS per milligrams BOD times time. All right, so you have this equation in your equation sheet. 
it'll be up to you to remember the difference between this k and that other k and to understand that y is the yield coefficient so if you're given the yield coefficient then you have some info about this k and this mu max all right so we'll see um, with this and with this yield coefficient term which by the way this yield coefficient is milligrams vss per milligrams bod with that we can get a rate of substrate utilization so we already have this growth rate we know that now the rate at which we're using substrate is going to be um it's going to be directly related to that growth rate but negative right because we're removing substrate while we're growing bacteria so in this case we've got sub um a rate of that substrate utilization it's going to be negative the growth rate divided by that yield coefficient uh, so that when we do that this growth rate uh, you know it, it it's going to give us um, instead of milligrams you know milligrams of vss that we're uh, producing because the the growth rate this is per time and milligrams vss per liter so it's the amount of the mass of uh, microbes per time. And so essentially we're just changing that from the mass of microbes per time to the mass of um, substrate per time when we divide by y. Because that'll be, because um, y is VSS per BOD, R of G is BO, uh, excuse me, VSS per time. And so when we divide, we're going to get rid of the VSS. And then our, our substrate utilization rate is going to be BOD per time, which is what we wanted. And obviously, I'm saying milligrams BOD per liter here, or, mil, you know, or not per liter, so excuse me, milligrams BOD uh, per time. OK, that's just to point out we, we can convert. And it's just a matter of using that substrate utilization rate, or the yield coefficient, I mean. OK, so then the last component here to understand the system is, OK, what about the death? Um, the bacteria will be dying during this time. Um, even, if, even during this uh, growth phase, some bacteria will die. Um, so it's not that they just live forever until the death phase. It's actually just this constant process. Some are growing, some are dying. Um, and at some point, the rate at which they're dying dominates, um, whereas early on, the rate at which they're growing dominates. So typically, in a wastewater system, we want to be operating um, at pretty much a constant amount of bacteria, um, but we want them in the growth phase. So even though we're getting rid of a bunch by sending them down the pipes. Um, we want them to be growing rapidly. To understand that net, uh, net difference, we do need this death rate. Um, and especially if we're kind of looking at what's happening in a pond, we need to counterbalance and have a net growth rate based on um, you know, how much are growing versus how much are dying. So this death or decay uh, rate, RD, is going to be simply negative kd times x so kd is this uh, death and decay rate constant per time so this is first order decay as you might expect okay so that's quite simple we don't have any formulas to figure out what kd is i'll show you some um, some typical parameters. Actually, I'll show you a table in the book. Go ahead and do that now. Let me rotate it. Okay. 
So the book has this table, 6.7 here. And essentially, it's showing us kind of common parameters for these different things that we've been talking about. Um, the K, the K there, we've got um, KD. So typical units here uh, per day for KD and some range and a default value. So we'll probably use some of these. Um, I'll use them or, or um, values near or at these ranges when I make problems. So if, if you wanted to design your own problem or you know change some parameter to test something on your own, um, this would be a good place to look uh, to make some adjustments and do some calculations. But essentially it gives you a feel for uh, these units. So this maximum specific growth rate coefficient is about three per day, whereas the death rate is 0 0.06 per day. Um, our typical K value is five milligrams BOD per VSS per day, uh, and so on. So the this maximum, this KS, half, half velocity constant, so that amount of food where the bacteria are half as happy as they could be, that's between 25 and 100. Um, and if you consider that in light of what I told you about the um, weak versus strong wastewater, said weak wastewater is something like 60 milligrams BOD per liter, super strong wastewater is something like 500. So um, a lot of wastewaters will actually be um, at or above this half velocity constant. Um, and you can see that means a fair amount of them will also be at the maximum, um, at the maximum food so that the, uh, will be at that mu max um, for mu. Okay, so feel free to take a look there. Um, just wanted to show you that. Okay, so let's get this net growth rate then. If we have growth and we have decay, what's our net? Well, net would be r prime of g is the way we'll call it. So that's um, that prime, meaning kind of the net growth rate. This is going to be our net change in x. So we can define this simply as rg plus rd. Um, we can also, instead of using rg, we can put in um, that substitution because we know rg from that previous slide is equal to negative rsu, that negative substrate utilization rate, times the yield coefficient. Okay, so I'm rearranging this on purpose because we end up working with um, if we do it this way, it can become easier to work with the units. Um, we don't we don't have to at this moment, but you know we'll. I want you to kind of see that this this process may be helpful swapping in or swapping out uh, terms like that. Okay, so we can define R of G then as negative Y R S R S U plus this negative K D X. Okay, so from here, I want to work through a long and challenging um, example problem with you. This is example 6.9, page 322. Um, I have, again, this, this table up here with some typical parameters. The, uh, the problem asks, asks us to look at um, or to use, I think, the default parameters um, in this problem. So we have a shallow pond here. It's depicted in figure 6.14. It stays well mixed due to wind and the steady flow through a small creek. And uh, the question itself, we'll come back to the, that previous one in a moment. Um, the question itself asks, if the microbes in the pond consume the inflowing biodegradable organic matter according to typical kinetics, determine the following. We've got A, the BOD leaving the pond, B, the biodegradable organic matter removal efficiency of the pond, 
So that's the uh, that's S, or that's just BOD. So that's the removal of S is what I mean. Um, so as an efficiency, we could say S minus S naught. So what we ended with, actually that would be the other way. What we started with minus what we ended with compared to what we started with times 100% if we want it in percent, right? So that would be what we're looking for there. And then C, the concentration of volatile suspended solids leaving the pond. Okay, so we've got um, several things going on here, and I've got the, the start of it there, start of the solutions. So let's come back and take a look at what's happening. We have this pond. Um, it stays well mixed. It's a CSDR, essentially. Um, so we, we can presume it's safe to say this is going to act like a CSDR. We've got an in, inflowing stream, outflowing stream, some volume. Uh, that's 200 cubic meters. And some amount of bacteria, X, and some amount of substrate, S. We've got those flow rates. Um, all these different parameters and the question really is um, first what is s so when we think about it a was asking s equals um, b is kind of follow follows up on that and c asks us what does x equal because that says x leaving and since it's a CSTR, um, it's really just asking what that x is okay so we've got these two parameters that we want to know. Um, these are obviously important for any wastewater uh, treatment system, so that's, that's why we're focusing in here. All right, so let's read through the very start of the solutions here, and then I'm gonna give you a couple minutes to think about how you might approach this, and then start leading you through pieces of it, because it, this is a uh, a pretty involved process and I'm going to use this to teach a little bit about how to approach a CSDR in this manner. Now it ends up getting more complicated and so we simplify it with a few equations when we add the recycle line. So there is going to be a big distinction between just a CSDR with nothing happening, with well, nothing else happening, and um, the CSDR with recycle where we have we're recycling a mass of bacteria. So that it turns out, as we think about the mass balance, X not here, if that's zero, it's a completely different system, right? And in our case here with the stream, we had X not is zero, okay? So that difference um, is important. And what we'll find later is we recycle to make sure that that's not zero because that gives us faster growing bacteria. We can accomplish more um, removal of substrate. Okay, but in this case, the pond is kind of what happens in nature. It's kind of the very basic way to do a treatment set setup. So we're gonna take a look at how these mass balances are going to operate here. Now, the first thing you might be thinking is we have S and X. That's two different things that are varying in here that we are doing mass balances on. So that's, um, that's important. Okay, so for part A, so first we can uh, assume that this is, can be modeled as a steady state CSDR. It's well mixed. We'll assume the stream flow has been steady at, at a steady flow rate and composition for a long time. So A, set up a mass balance on the microbial mass using the pond as the control volume. And the variables in figure 614, we can, re we can write it as this zero equals Q X naught. So that's what's coming in. And this is a mass balance on the mi microbial mass. Now, you might be thinking well, why are we doing ma microbial mass when we're trying to solve for the substrate? It's a little tricky, but essentially um, we will end up finding that the, we will, with solving it this way, we're going to have X cancel out 
and be left with just s. So it's counterintuitive, um, but that's the way we're going to do it. So what's coming in minus what's going out plus this net reaction in that volume, that's our starting point. So go ahead and start there, uh, simplify, and expand out this R of G as kind of your first step. I'm going to write up a few uh, pieces over here on the side for you to uh, work with.
Okay, so the first thing to remember, or I'll remind you here, is we can define this r prime of g as that yield times the substrate utilization rate minus kdx, or we could just leave this as r of g, and we know r of g is x times mu, um, so that goes here, x and mu, and of course multiplied by v minus v times kdx, so this is going to s essentially be this component, right? So then we can r rewrite from here and move from that point. Next thing you'll probably notice is we have an x in every term, so we can uh, simplify there. And so I'll give you a couple minutes to work on simplifying from here because you can see that uh, once we cancel the x's, we're left with just s and some other terms that we are given. So from there you should be able to solve, it's going to take some algebra, but you should be able to solve for S to find your answer. Once we do that, part C becomes possible because we now have a value of S, and even though when we do a mass balance the other way, uh, we'll, we'll have to do a mass balance on the substrate concentration. When we do that, we can solve for X because we already have S. Okay, so this little occurrence here of the X is canceling out makes this system possible for us to solve for those two unknowns um, that are both changing or both uh, interdependent that way.
it just becomes a lot of algebra at this point and I'll uh, run through it real quick before we finish for today uh, but essentially we're just working on solving for s and we can um, expand expand things out separate them and ultimately we're getting closer here s theta mu max minus 1 minus theta kd equals Okay, so at some point we finally get to an equation for s. That's going to be ks times 1 plus theta kd divided by this mu, uh, theta mu max minus 1. Minus theta kd. Now this is the substrate in a, a uh, CSTR at steady state with zero influent um, bacteria. So for those systems, you could memorize and use this equation, simplified out. Um, I'm not typically going to make you um, decide or make you figure out on your own that you need to do this mass balance before that mass balance, I would give you some sort of a hint like this problem did. It asks you to solve um, the BOD before solving for the, the X. So I would do that, that same thing for you and probably even nudge you in the right direction, say hint solve for the mass balance for X first. Um, so this is a pretty involved problem and we only got halfway through it. Um, we'll come back and start uh, next time at this point. The only thing I want to show you is this equation here is only for real, fairly limited circumstances. I don't remember, I might give it to you on the, uh, the formula sheet, but it's, it's for this specific case, right? The x naught is zero and this is a CSTR, essentially a CSTR with no recycle is what it is. Okay, with that, we'll pick up here next time. And we'll actually plug in the numbers and get a, get a problem there, or a solution. All right, have a good day.